Welcome to episode 14 of the Willpower Podcast. My guest today is Peter Lin. Peter is a yoga teacher, a Wim Hof instructor, and a massage therapist. Peter's a really interesting guy. Uh, we talk a lot in this conversation about habits, building a life, and working through depression. Hope you enjoy. Okay, tell me about being a uh, Wim Hof instructor. Yeah. Um, before I answer, do you want to know like more about general what Wim Hof is about or like my experience? Yeah, let's go with both in okay. whatever order makes sense to you. Sure. Yeah, especially for folks out there who might not be as familiar with Wim Hof. So the Wim Hof method is a practice that involves breath work and cold exposure. Um, those are the two main practices. And he says there are three, he being Wim Hof, uh, that there are three main pillars. So the pillars are breath work, cold exposure, and your mindset. So these practices have a lot of different benefits. There is, um, I would say, a limited amount of science since. The studies are still pretty new, but the studies so far seem really promising in terms of what effects that these practices can have. So some folks are reporting um, stronger immune systems or getting sick less often. Um, some other folks are recovering from autoimmune disorders or diseases. And there's also a lot of great cardiovascular health um, benefits. Some people have also reported like... Um, recovering from cancer or other diseases as well. And I think in general, um, the scope of the benefits and the specifics of the practice is like very large. Might be too much to get into all the details here right now. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a really promising thing. And if folks have any questions about it, they're welcome to reach out to me after. And for my personal experience, so I remember when I first heard about the Wim Hof method, I was very skeptical. I was like, um, you're telling me that just breathing can have all these benefits? That seems insane. But there were free videos on YouTube, so I figured, you know, couldn't hurt to try it if it's not costing me any money. And so I kind of looked into it more tried to breathwork practices a little bit and remember feeling all of these sensations that I had never felt before. And I was like, whoa, that was nuts. And so I continued to dig into it a little bit more, started to read up on some of those studies and did some more research. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like actually pretty legit. And in my own practice, I was finding that I was just feeling a lot better when I did it on a regular basis. I was um, getting sick less often. I don't want to prescribe it as like a miracle, you know, do this thing and you'll never get sick or never have any ailments ever again, because I don't think that's true. Um, but similar to any other healthy habit that you might have, whether it's diet or exercise, I did notice that when I got sick, I was not um, struggling as badly with symptoms as I used to. And again, just not getting sick as often, but it wasn't like I was completely immune. Um, I've also found that it's helped with just like physical performance. I like to play sports. Um, so that's from two perspectives. One is, I think, and there's science behind this as well, but uh, like physically training the body, the Wim Hof method is pretty good for that, for actually becoming physically stronger and having more endurance and things along those lines and the other piece is um, being able to ground yourself mentally so it helps with a lot of relaxation and calming especially in sports if there are moments where there's a lot of pressure um, we always talk about like 
or see those moments on TV where, you know, it's like a game winning shot and there's lots of people watching. Um, those moments can be really stressful and it can be really easy to miss that shot or screw something up because you're feeling nervous. And so I think having the Wim Hof method is um, a great practice for being able to stay calm in those moments. And so because of the benefits that I experienced from it, I wanted to, one, deepen my experience and learning in the method. That's what one of the reasons why I decided to become an instructor. And the other piece was to be able to help give back and help share with others what was really beneficial for me. Amazing. What was the actual process of becoming an instructor like? Yeah, so there are a couple courses online that the official Wim Hof platform has. So you start with one that is kind of open to anyone who wants to explore more about the Wim Hof method. So it's their fundamentals course. So they'll teach you how to do the breathing. They'll teach you how to do the cold exposure. And they'll also teach you a bunch of science involved um, behind like both of these practices. And of course, their third pillar with the mindset. Um, they talk about how committing to yourself and committing to these practices is going to be key as well. You can't really just do the breath work once and be good for the rest of your life. So after you complete that, you are then eligible for their next online course, which is a more advanced um, and instructor focused course. So for that one, they're going to teach you some deeper details about the science, especially since as an instructor, you probably want to be able to explain it to others and answer questions. And they'll also talk about things like how you actually teach the method and things that you should be thinking about in terms of, um, you know, maybe it's safety, maybe it's liability insurance, maybe it's marketing, just other things to be considering when you're gonna be teaching. And then after you complete that online course, you're eligible to complete the final phase of your training, which is going to be roughly a week long intensive. So I did mine in Spain, but you basically travel to a location with other Wim Hof instructors who are trained to train instructors. Wim Hof himself may or may not be there. Unfortunately, he wasn't for me. Um, but yeah, they do an in-person training for a week to continue to build on those skills that you learned online and to get some real reps. So we'll be practicing how to teach with all of our classmates in that training. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just want to share. I also do, um, I do the breathing basically every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was very similar how I started. Like I, I saw it somewhere and I was like, okay, what is this? And then I think I, I got my friend his book but I hadn't read it yet. And then a while later, maybe like six months later, I get the book and I read it. And then I'm like, okay, let me actually try this for real. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started doing the breathing. And like you said, it is, there are some times when you do it and you're just like, what was that? What just happened? Yeah. Um, and now as a normal practice, I've noticed like, cause it's, it's basically like you're doing um, a lot of breathing and then you're doing a breath hold and you do that you know multiple rounds and I've noticed in those rounds it's like incredible stillness in the not breathing part mm -hmm. and th that's where I'll have like these little thoughts of like oh yeah this is like a good thing you should be doing like it's it's just like that stillness where like good things can come out and totally. I've noticed that happen multiple times with it mm -hmm. um so yeah I definitely I'm a I think it's a good thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think more people should look into it. Totally. Um, yeah, what, because I know you also do kind of like somatic breath work. Do you mm -hmm. differentiate those two? I do. So somatic breath work sessions to me, um, they also can be much longer. So somatic breath work sessions can range from a similar time range as Wim Hof breathing. Maybe it's like five to 10 minutes. But often, I think the most powerful sessions are about an hour long. Wim Hof breathing can go that long as well, but usually those sessions are going to be closer to 10 to 15 minutes. And the intent behind each practice is a little bit different as well, at least the way that I see it. So somatic breath work 
is very focused on so uh have you heard of or read the book the body keeps the score i've heard of it okay yeah um so the general idea is that stress or traumas that we experience are like physically stored in our body the way that we carry stress or tension in our muscles is related to um traumas or experiences that we've had and so a lot of the intent with somatic breath work is to really tap into allowing the body to release whatever is held there, whatever it needs. So sometimes that may look like shaking or crying or screaming, sometimes laughing, um, just like any you know, type of emotion that has been bottled up or held in there. And I think it's really intelligent with knowing what the body needs. Um, so sometimes it's just like a nap too. I've had sessions where I've fallen asleep. I've had other sessions where I'm just like uncontrollably sobbing. Um, so yeah, to me, somatic breath work is more about focusing on that like emotional trauma release. And the same thing can happen in Wim Hof. Um, the actual breathing style is very similar. Um, but in Wim Hof, I tend to think of the intention that's kind of more focused on like, uh, like grounding and also a little bit more rooted in the scientific parts of the method with like what's actually happening in the body and how that's good for you. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the benefits already. And again, there's like a whole world that we could get into there, but I tend to think of Wim Hof as a little bit more of like, a um, maybe a good analogy would be like Wim Hof to me is like, diet and exercise that's like good for you and somatic breath work is kind of like going to a therapist mm -hmm. okay i got you um yeah so on that topic let's jump into we had discussed before um your journey from childhood to kind of it sounded like you almost lacked a blueprint for life <laughs> totally <laughs> um and so i love to to dig into that and how you how you figured that out yeah. Um, so to give a little bit of background, when I grew up, my parents were not really present for me in many ways. So my dad mostly ignored me and my mom gave me a lot of attention, but it was more so about like survival. So she'd be like, you got to make sure you're eating enough. You got to make sure you're healthy. You got to make sure you exercise. and I didn't really have conversations with my parents. I don't think they ever asked me like, oh, how was your day at school? Or like, how's it going? It was either like, you got to eat your food or I was ignored or they would fight a lot too. So sometimes I would get yelled at um, or they would just be yelling at each other. And growing up, a typical day at school for me would be like, I go to school I'd go to track or cross-country practice after and I'd come home and my parents would be fighting I'd eat dinner by myself I'd do homework by myself they're still fighting do you have siblings I have an older brother but he's a lot older so uh for the most part I didn't actually grow up with him yeah so he kind of experienced what I did but separately mm -hmm. yeah um so yeah it was pretty tough it was lonely and i had no idea how to socially behave because my parents weren't very social with me and so as i grew up and went through middle school high school definitely felt very awkward and not cool and just didn't have a lot of confidence in myself i remember like one time someone uh, was like trying to be my friend and came up to me and talked to me and the story in my head was, oh, they're just pretending and they're making fun of me because, like, who would want to hang out with me? Mm -hmm. And, like, I remember, like, she was upset by that, which makes sense. But I was just in this place where I just couldn't even, like, accept that. Yeah. Um, and I was lucky enough that in high school, um, on my, like, track and cross country team, there were some friends that I made that were really amazing and they were kind of the first step into showing me like oh this is what good friends look like and here is what it looks like when people talk to you and care about you and 
that was the opening. Um, again, very thankful for those friends. As I progressed into college, still had some of those friendships, and I'm still friends with those people today. I'm very grateful for them. And while that was helping with me starting to learn some of the ways to behave in a social manner, I was still really much struggling with women and dating. Because believe it or not, when you don't know how to talk to people, <laughs> it makes dating pretty difficult. So yeah, in high school and college, uh, I didn't date anyone. Not because I didn't want to, but because anyone that I was interested in, they just weren't interested back. They just said they wanted to be friends. And it was it was very hard for me because I was really into some of these people and it just like never worked out. And especially progressing towards graduating college, I was like, uh, what's going on? Like, you know, my friends have been dating and like some of them have successful relationships, but I like still haven't even like gone on a date with like anyone. Um, so after graduating college, I moved out to Madison, Wisconsin for work and I met a girl there and we started dating and that was like to me I was head over heels I was so excited I was like ah I just had to wait long enough you know I finally got it made this is good now yeah um meanwhile unknown to me at the time like I still had this you know all this shit underneath that I hadn't dealt with and I think that kind of, that stuff underneath eventually led to the relationship falling apart I didn't really know why at the time um but you know, it was really heartbreaking. I thought that that was my person. I thought that was like the love of my life and that I just had to wait long enough and I had finally found my soulmate. Um, so I was quite devastated when she broke things off. And while that was the most painful thing that I have experienced, it was also probably the best thing to have ever happened to me. Because in that moment, it really forced me to look at myself and say, oh, something is clearly not working here. Um, previously, I had thought if I'm smart and I get good grades and I'm athletic and fit, then like girls will like me, right? And so I worked really hard to be smart. I worked really hard to be fit. And lo and behold, I was still not successful with women. And so. I kind of went off the deep end, just like researching and looking into everything I could find. It was podcasts, it was books, it was online articles. And I started discovering a lot of amazing information that I didn't realize about myself. Um, ways in which that I was being needy, ways in which that I was not confident, um, ways that I was like still holding a lot of my trauma and how that was getting in the way of me relating. And it wasn't enough to just read the books. I also had to go out there and like practice these things. And so I started putting myself out there and going on dates and talking to women. And it was really awkward. It was like super, you know, weird and uncomfortable. And I remember just being very embarrassed um, many times by the way that I was behaving. I was like, that is the opposite of what smooth looks like. <laughs> um, but it was really good for me to go through that. And over time, with a lot of repetition, um, I started learning more about how to connect and how to be social and how to interact with women. And I think more importantly, I was starting to learn that on the inside that things were okay, that I could love myself, that if someone rejected me, that I would be okay because that happened a lot. I got rejected a lot. And that, in fact, being rejected is actually a very good thing um, because it helps with your own growth and learning that you're going to be okay despite it. And also with learning to respect boundaries and to be okay with where people are at. Um, and another thing is that if she rejects me, then it's probably saving us both a lot of time that she told me as opposed to like things dragging on and getting into a situation that is not good for either of us 
Um, so that was really good. And I think also an abundance mindset, just knowing that there's a lot of people out there. If it doesn't work out with one girl, it's not like I lost my soulmate forever. There's what, like seven, eight billion people in the world. Like it'll be fine. Um, so I think the internal shift that happened was really powerful, very life-changing for me throughout that journey. And some of these other practices that we've talked about have also helped to back that, whether it's Wim Hof, breath work, somatic breath work, also things like yoga or meditation. These practices that really talk about grounding and getting into yourself, being in the present moment, being okay with things as they are, um, those are really helpful too in these moments. And so. Yeah, that's kind of the summary of the story um, so far. Yeah, what do you think was your biggest uh, like? If you could pick one thing for someone who was in that place that you were, what would it, what would it be? Like one practice, one thing that they can do today to start on this path. Mm. Yeah, I would say the pasana meditation. It's uh, very easy to start with. You literally just need a place to sit. That's about it. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of pressure. It's not like you're getting out there and approaching people in public or anything like that. And it can be very hard still to sit in stillness. Um, but to me, it's been one of the most powerful practices for life. Just being able to sit and... I guess to back up a little bit to give some background on what Vipassana meditation is, it is meditation, obviously, and you're sitting in a way where you're just observing what sensations, what emotions, what feelings come up. And the key is to just observe those things. So you're not reacting to them. You're not craving a different state, different feeling. You're not trying to get away from how you feel. You're just noticing what's here. So it's a really practice of accepting. Um, and it sounds very simple, but I think, you know, if someone were to just do this for like 10 minutes a day, it can be really life changing. Yeah. And like recognizing these, um, these sensations or appearances in consciousness as that. Like when we have emotional uh, responses, it it does a good job of tricking our brain into like this is real this is a serious thing like mm -hmm. my example is yesterday i reached out to like a guest for the podcast and this person is like way above like out of my league in terms of like their instagram following all of this mm. and i just found their email and i sent her an email and was like hey i'd love to have you on blah 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 and i hear back and it's like no we're not gonna do it sure and i felt the rejection i was like oh fuck. and so i'm like I notice the feeling of rejection and I notice that I feel like I need to be in a bad mood now. Mm. And then I caught it. I caught that and I said, oh, this is just the feeling of rejection. Like I'm feeling rejection. Let me just notice that. And so I think it's, it's so important to be able to notice things as they are, not right. as the story they tell us. Totally. And I bet that after you were able to catch yourself that you felt a lot better. Yeah, because yeah. then I could just kind of like process it and then it moves along. Yeah. It's just a feeling. Totally. And I think this is a really good example. And it's awesome that you were able to do that because that's not easy. Because <laughs> it doesn't you know, always happen either. Yeah. It's, like we can talk about the idea, but in the moment when that happens and the emotions come up, it's so easy to just get caught up in the emotions and totally forget that meditation is even a thing. Mm -hmm. And so. To me, when I hear that you were able to catch yourself, even if it's not always, the fact that you are able to sometimes um, tells me that like, you pr probably have a practice in mindfulness and meditation like that you were doing separately that allowed you in that moment to be able to find that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing about meditation is it is a practice. Like you are practicing for something. Right. And it's good to remember because I think a lot of people don't understand that part. And it seems like meditation is a thing in itself of like you go into this blissed out state of just sitting and like it can be enjoyable, um, but it's, it is still, it's a practice. 
you're practicing for real life. Exactly. Yeah. And I like to think of all of these other things like that too, whether it's meditation, yoga, breath work. It's practice for real life. It's not just the thing for itself purely. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk more about, let's get into dating a little bit. Uh-huh. Um, so you mentioned you, you felt like socially awkward growing up and then um, you get into this relationship out of college and then that falls apart. And then now you're like, okay, what do I do? Yeah. So what is, what is the process like of getting yourself out there? Yeah. Um, so for me, it started off with, as I was reading those books, I started off with hitting the dating apps. That's kind of what I feel like people know as the most common thing. It's often said, like, you know, I hear my friends talking to if one of my friends is single and they're trying to get them out there. It's like, oh, like you should get on Hinge or get on Bumble or whatever app. And um, I think the apps are actually not a bad place to start. I think they get a lot of bad rap for um, a lot of reasons. It can be very demoralizing if you're not getting matches or it might feel like superficial or. It's just like a hassle to be going through these interactions online. Um, so yeah, there are definitely downsides, but I do think it can be, you know, it's better than nothing. And so that's kind of where I started. I was going on dates from apps and it got to a point where to me it felt like, oh, I am kind of getting the hang of how to like connect with people and connect with people on a more intimate level. This feels like good enough and at the same time i was like dating in relationships the partner that you have is going to be one of the most like important things in your life it's going to be one of the most major parts of your life why would i stop at just good enough like it, it doesn't make sense to like you know say the quality of my life is it's like fine <laughs> it's like you know it, it didn't make sense to me um and so I invested pretty heavily into continuing to do that. So I signed up for um, dating coaching courses and I actually traveled to actually be coached by other dating coaches. And I remember some people telling me that that seemed like ridiculous to me. And I was like, well, an athlete might pay a coach to like tell them how to play the sport. Or you might pay like a therapist to help with your mental health. Why would I not do something similar for something as important as like the relationships in my life? And I remember um, really exploring this practice of approaching strangers in public, which I think you're familiar with mm -hmm. as well. And that was one of the things that I got coaching in too. And this specific practice has been one of the most life-changing things for me is to go out there and approach people in public. Um, it forces you to confront so many fears, so many stories that you tell. Like, oh, I don't want to be creepy. I don't want to be bothering her. Like, oh my God, that person would definitely not want to talk to me. Like so many stories come up. Um, and then to actually move through it and approach someone and to see the outcomes it was really helpful too to see oh like that story that I was telling was bullshit or like that person actually was into me or like that person really was not into me and I'm still fine like I didn't die because she rejected me and I think one of the key points in this practice too is to learn to like read people and respect boundaries Sometimes when I tell people that I like have approached women in public, they uh, get worried that it's like predatorial or like dangerous, which I think is understandable because sometimes men like are very dangerous to women, especially if they're just approaching them. And so I think it's really important to like recognize, oh, if she says no, if she rejects you, like that is totally fine. Do not like push back. Do not fight. Like leave her alone if she says no um and yeah um so as i was doing that a lot i at one point i had quit my full-time job to really explore doing this more i was 
actually for a while at Zilker Park here in Austin, just basically living there every day. And I would just go and talk to people. And I definitely got rejected a lot. And I was finding that in myself, there were a lot of feelings that came up when that happened. A lot of sadness, a lot of shame, a lot of am I not good enough kind of feeling. And this is where something that we were talking about with the Vipassana and meditation earlier really came into play. So I wasn't always able to, but I would often try to take those emotions and say, hey, it's okay. It's just a feeling I'm experiencing. I don't need to tell this huge story about like how I'm not a worthy human being because a stranger on the street didn't want to go on a date with me. Like even as I say it, it sounds ridiculous, right? Um, and so I was becoming more and more okay with myself. I was finding a lot of self-love starting to come out of this process of being rejected a lot. And I was also finding more confidence and abundance in my dating life, realizing that, oh, like if it doesn't work out with someone, I can just go like talk to someone else on the street. I can talk to someone else in the park. And if it doesn't work out with them, there's like, several million people in the city and there's like several billion people in this world um it's gonna be fine if it doesn't work out with someone and these internal shifts were the most powerful part of the journey for me as it was starting to actually change my identity and one of my coaches told me this and i think it's very true he was saying that this whole dating and relationship journey is more about your own journey as a human being. And as you start to develop and change the, the dates, and for um, me as like a heterosexual man, uh, women, like that's almost more of a side effect of like the internal shift that happens. And so, yeah, I was also very thankful and grateful for the adventures that I had and like the connections with women that I made along the way. Um, had some like, really amazing experiences that I never thought would have been possible. Um, and those were all awesome and definitely kind of what I was looking for when I got into this. Um, but again, I think the more like valuable piece was kind of what shifted in me. Yeah. That is like, that's so true. And that's the thing I've, um, I had that same revelation of like, this isn't, it's not just about the dates. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's so much more. It's like you can grow so much and like doing approaching, like you said, it brings things and like in general, just putting dating as a priority in your life. Like it puts so much, it brings so much stuff to the surface. Like mm -hmm. so many of these things that we have built in these like voices in our head, those come up and they get loud as soon as you start talking to girls. Oh yeah. Like getting rejected and all of that. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's another it's like another practice of mindfulness like you said um it's a way to get used to hearing those voices and then accepting that those are not you and mm -hmm. um again like allowing them to be but at the same time being like you're just a voice in my head this is not true right so i definitely think it's a um it's a great thing for a guy to to use or anybody honestly um do you do you still do it at all or where where are you at right now yeah so um i haven't been doing it as much lately and this is kind of related to it's funny because i know a question that you've asked other folks on your other episodes is something that you're currently struggling with mm -hmm. and something that i've been struggling with is some depression and burnout so Earlier, we had talked about, about um, a lot of these things I had done for personal growth, whether it was stuff in the dating space or yoga or meditation or breath work. And it really mattered to me. I cared a lot. So I went very hard pursuing all of these things, even quitting my job to do so. And I went a little too hard. I ended up, and I'm still feeling it now, just like, really burned out, really not caring about things. Um, one of the biggest flags to me was like feeling my empathy like kind of die out. Um, yeah, so 
too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And I think that's what happened when I was exploring this personal growth so hard. Um, so yeah, I've been navigating that. I've been seeing a therapist and trying to figure out like, how do I get back into things in a way that's going to be more balanced and what is going to be most loving to me? Cause in a way me pursuing all of this personal growth was still subtly communicating to myself, like, you're not good enough. <laughs> you have to keep going. And so even though I had found a lot of benefit and success from these practices, including cold approach and dating, right now I'm kind of in a space where I need to rest and take a break and figure out what balance is right for me um, as I slowly come back into it. Yeah. Have you... I mean, there's so many ways you could go from here. Have you thought of like, do you have a guideline for like, here's the way I want to move forward? Mm. Sort of. So I'm very type A and organized and I love having a plan where it's like, yeah, you know, to figure out my depression, I'm going to like rest and then I'm going to like slowly introduce like small amounts of reps here. And then like, as that feels good, I'll gradually build up. You know, yeah. it's like in my head, I, I love that. and ironically it's that kind of thinking that kind of got me into this place where i was planning out like okay yeah like i'm gonna do all these approaches and then i'm gonna like do breath work and i'm gonna do yoga and meditation and here's the way it's gonna combine i'm gonna scale it this way in the future and then i'm gonna do this training and then crash mm -hmm. um so part of the work that i've been doing with my therapist is can i just let that go and rest and really tune into what would be the most loving and nourishing for myself as opposed to what I think I need to do to be productive. And so the plan, so to speak, is be okay with things as they are without like needing this plan, which is like really, it gets really jumbled because then I'm like, oh, that's like the meditation practice. You know, it's like doing these practices in a way that's really focusing on love and nourishment for myself as opposed to I need to grow. I need to figure something out. I need to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you balance that with like, like things that aren't really nourishing, but that you can kind of convince yourself. Um, so for example, let's say like watching TV or eating unhealthy foods. Those are things for me that I'm like, my my mind knows how to trick me and it's like oh like you can just relax for now but i don't think it's actually better for me mm. whereas there are like nourishing things that genuinely help me rest that i feel like are better uh-huh do you see a balance there of like how do you how do you genuinely rest without giving yourself the the um I would say like permission, but like the go ahead to just like, okay, just do whatever feels good in the moment. Yeah. Follow the hedonism. Like, uh huh. This is a very, very tricky thing. It's extremely tricky and it's going to be very different from individual to individual as well. So I want to preface that with, um, before I speak about my experience, because mm -hmm. I think it can be very different for someone else. I think the line between like, is it rest or is it like addiction can be like right. pretty tricky to find as well. And so, um, yeah, something that I'm still figuring out too. So for me personally, I really love to play video games. And before my depression, I remember every time I'd play video games, it was like, yeah, I'm kind of falling into the pressure of allowing myself to play. I don't really like think I should be playing because I could be doing something productive. I could mm -hmm. be learning something new, but instead I'm playing a video game. So uh not great, but I guess like I'm just failing right now or something. Yeah. Um and when I crashed really hard and the depression hit, I was just playing video games like all day, all the time. I didn't want to do anything else. I barely even wanted to play the video games at times. Um but it was just like this state of being where I just like didn't have it. 
to do anything else. So I was kind of stuck in a rut, so to speak, that you could call it, with playing these video games and just being like, ugh, like I'm not motivated to do anything else, but this feels shitty because I'm just like wasting my life away or something. And ugh, crap, whatever. You should kind of like um, keep digging the hole a little bit deeper. Sort of, yeah. Um, and then I started talking to my therapist. And he was like, why is this bad? Like, you spent a lot of time doing this productivity, this growth stuff. It makes sense that you're tired and that, like, you deserve to have some rest. Like, it's not a bad thing for you to go and play video games and to also, like, not feel guilt in that. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was playing like an excessive amount of video games and coming to terms with myself and not feeling guilt in it. It's like a very strange thing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, you know, been on a computer playing games for like 10 hours. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. Like, that's what I need right now. Um, And again, that's why I wanted to stress that's like, it's very different from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. That's not like the typical thing I would recommend to someone is to go and play games for 10 hours in a day and like feel fine about it. Um, but for me, I think that's actually where I was. It was like, oh, this, this I think is actually what I need after pushing myself so hard in life. Mm-hmm. And as I started to find this mindset, and again, it seems like a theme with our conversation so far is like this internal shift. It was a mindset of like, oh, what would actually be like, really loving for me and what do like i actually need versus what i think i'm supposed to be doing Mm -hmm. and it was shifting into that that kind of helped me discern like okay am i playing video games right now because this is actually like a nourishing break for me like i need the rest um which today is more often true than not um versus am i like falling into some sort of addiction falling into some sort of like trap of not um like taking care of myself so the question that i ask myself is like is this the loving thing for me to do for myself is this like the nourishing thing for me to do for myself and often that's still a very hard question to answer especially when it comes to something like watching TV or playing video games or eating junk food, things that we typically consider more as like vices. Um, but I do think there, there is a place for, yeah, the positives in those. And it's going to be up to the individual to figure out like what actually makes sense for you. Yeah, there is, there is an issue with feeling like guilt or shame towards those things. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me it is, I mean, it could be either. So YouTube and um, either junk food or just like overeating. Uh huh. It's like I'll or like eating before bed. That's a good one. Um, it's like I I have like a little snack before bed, and then I'm like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't supposed to do that, and so then I have the guilt or the shame around that, and then that allows me to then like justify eating more and more. Because it's like, oh, I already feel shame, so mm-hmm. I might as well make the most of it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if I didn't have that, I could have a snack and then be like, okay, like maybe I didn't want to do that, but I did it, and it's okay. That's where I'm at. Totally. And then it doesn't lead into that like cycle of more and more. Right. So I definitely, I definitely agree with you that like, I don't think shame has a place. Um, in this at all guilt is a little bit because so guilt versus shame Mm -hmm. shame is like there's something wrong with me inherently Mm -hmm. because i did that and then guilt is just like okay i i'm not happy that i did that um Mm -hmm. i think guilt has its place in certain cases shame i don't i don't know if it's useful Mm. i mean it i wouldn't say it's not useful because it can get you moving like it definitely can but at the same time it's like probably not in a healthy way Mm -hmm. it's at a in a way that burns you down Mm -hmm. um but anyways that is just to say that i don't think shame has a place in this Mm. in terms of like these doing these behaviors that are you know maybe not nourishing or that you're not sure about feeling shame towards them doesn't 
help you actually discern that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that my therapist told me too was to imagine um, like how I would talk to a friend that was in my situation or maybe imagine myself as like a five-year-old kid in the same situation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I wouldn't be like, you're a horrible human being because you ate junk food, Yeah, you know? Be like, okay, like maybe you don't want to do that, but it's okay, like I still love you and you know, things are going to be all right. And to kind of shift into talking to like myself that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what do you have a way like, where do you see, what do you see dating like playing a role in your life? How do you see it? In the future, are you looking for a lifelong partner, or mm. what is like the overarching goal? Yeah, so it's pretty open right now in terms of structure. Um, I do know that I want like connection and intimate connection with women, um, but in terms of like a lifelong partner um, versus other frameworks, like I had been exploring polyamory for a while and dating like multiple people um that is still an exploration and i've found that with the growth experience that things were like changing very rapidly with um my view of the world and my view of myself that i don't want to plan too far ahead and just be like yes like i am going for like this specific thing and that's it because mm -hmm. i would guess that as time goes on and as i continue to change and grow that um what i want in the moment could change as well and so it is more yeah exploratory i know that i want the like deeper level of connection still um when i say you know exploration or polyamory i don't mean like i just want to like date around casually and like have a bunch of sex that's not what i mean i mean more so like um i'm still seeking like intimate and deeper connection and the way that the relationship develops um open to whatever that might look like so maybe that is monogamy in long term sure like if that's the way it happens that's great maybe it's like polyamorous and i'm dating like multiple people and that if that's the way it turns out like that's also great um maybe it's something different who knows um but yeah i'm definitely open to like however it develops in a way that would most serve um myself and the people that i'm seeing okay i like that mm -hmm. so very open mm -hmm. um do you mind if we jump back mm -hmm. um if you're comfortable talking about this like period of kind of depression and uh yeah um what yeah so it came on with burnout what is it? Is it? I know the typical burnout feeling is like you're doing a bunch, and then there comes a point where you stop something, and then you just don't want to do any of it. Mm -hmm. Is that similar to your experience, or is there, you know, does it have its own flavor? What would you say? I would say that's pretty similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing a bunch of stuff. Um, did something spur it happen, or? It was a combination of a lot of things. So I was doing, I don't know, maybe like three or four different certifications slash training. So I was in massage therapy school. I was doing the Wim Hof instructor training. Um, I did somatic breathwork instructor training. I was also doing a training um, in this practice called circling or relatefulness, training to facilitate that. And outside of these official trainings, I was still trying to keep up with like do Wim Hof breath work every day and meditate every day and go and approach girls. And, um, I could feel it starting to wear on me, but in my head I was like, ah, oh, like it's okay. Keep going. And I remember, um, I'd also done like 12 or 13 retreats or something like that last year. Um, and yeah, I remember going to Europe for a month. Part of that trip was the Wim Hof instructor training in Spain. And part of it was backpacking through hostels. And um, it was a really great trip. But I just remember like 
especially then was when the crash started to really hit me. I was like, I just want to be alone and I'm sick of meeting new people in hostels and I'm sick of traveling and I just want to sit in my room and be in my bed and hide from the world and not do anything. And I think what's a little bit different about this burnout is I often hear burnout in the context of work. People, especially in corporate America today, sometimes get work really hard at their jobs and they get burned out and they don't want to do the work anymore. Um, which makes sense. And I think I had experienced a little bit of that back at the tech company I used to work at. Um, but for me, uh, this was a little bit different because I think work for a lot of people is, you know, for some people, they're lucky enough that it's their life passion. But for many people, it's um, something that they enjoy enough and something that they do. But it's not like they live their life to work. Um, for me, when I was exploring all this personal growth stuff, I was like, this is it. This is the way I'm going to live my life. This is my life direction. My purpose is going to be related to this. Um, let's go all in. And so when I burned out there, I was like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? Like, I thought I was supposed to do all this and now I just don't care about any of it. So there was kind of an identity mm -hmm. crisis in it as well. Um, yeah, and I do think it is still like my purpose and my direction, but learning that I do need rest and that there's balance in how hard I push there. Yeah, I think that's really important. The because I've I can relate on just like a lesser scale of like feeling like you found something, being super excited about it, and then like later not caring, like you said, mm. and like losing that kind of passion for it, mm -hmm. and. The most important thing from what I heard is like that it's still that still might be the passion. Mm -hmm. Like just because you don't feel it right now does not mean that that thing is gone. Right. This is just like like you said, you push yourself too hard and this is that drop after. Um, so, yeah, I do. I do like that, that it's not like, OK, that's completely done. I can't do that anymore. I need to move on, mm -hmm. even though that's what it feels like. Right. I'll say totally. Yeah, that's uh that's great. So let's talk um let's talk about mortality. Yeah. So we talked before about um you mentioned that death is like a big motivator for you. So mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about how you see it and like how you bring it into your life as a practice and all that. Yeah. It is one of the most powerful things for me and probably a grounding force for a lot of the things that we've talked about so far. Sometimes people um, shy away from the topic of death. It can be a little bit of a taboo thing, but I think it's a really incredible thing to talk about openly and to bring up. So one of the things that I think about a lot is being on your deathbed and looking back on your life. You know, let's say you're 80, 90, 100, however old you're going to be. Um, and you're looking at your life and you're like, damn. I wish I lived differently. I wish I didn't work my nine to five until I was 65. I wish I took more risks. I wish I, you know, asked that cute person out on a date. I wish whatever it was, right? And in that moment, I can imagine myself feeling I would give anything to like go back in time and be able to relive life and live it more fully and to not regret like not living up to like what could have been okay so imagine yourself in that situation and like boom magic right now you got that wish like you're here in the present moment came back. you came back you're here now you, you got your chance and this is the time to do it um so like the things that i'd done you know quitting my well-paying full-time job to be unemployed and like, go and talk to girls. On paper, it kind of seems ridiculous. It's, like, so financially, like, not smart on paper. Um, and at the same time, it was, like, well, this is what's calling me. And I feel like I want to figure out my dating life more. And so I'm going to do it. Um, I don't want to be on my deathbed and look back and be, like, 
what if I had quit my job instead of like having stayed at my job? And when I see like someone I want to approach, all these stories come up, right? Oh my God, I'm so scared. What if she says no? What if I'm really embarrassed? Like, what if I creep her out? What if she calls the cops on me? Right. And, and then I think, okay, like on my deathbed, am I going to wish I did this? Like, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Like go and take a risk and try it. Um, I remember it was pretty funny. Like I used to approach a lot of girls at Zilker park and someone had graffitied on the rocks there. They graffitied like in big letters, we all die. And I was like, this is actually perfect for me. <laughs> like, good reminder. Because in the grand scheme of things, a lot of the things that we worry about are just so trivial. Um, like, me worrying about getting rejected by a girl doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of life. And so, yeah, like, go and talk to her. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it's not really going to matter if, uh, like, that presentation at work sucked and, you know, your boss is mad at you. It's not going to matter if you show up to a party and you don't know anyone. It's really awkward. Um, these things that we worry about, like maybe there's other things that people worry about too, that we kind of blow up in our heads are really not that big of a deal when you think about the fact that like, in the end you die. And for some people, maybe that feels like depressing. But to me, I'm like, that is so liberating. Like I can go out there and like not worry about these things as much and just like try stuff and see what's fun and what's exciting and go on adventures. If I can let go of those worries, I can get blown up. And another piece that is related is knowing that we're going to die really helps me to like bring more gratitude for the present moment. So like every moment is precious because we're never going to get to experience it again. Like right now it's a Thursday on August, whatever it is, 2024, you and I are sitting here having this podcast, like this day and time and moment is never going to happen again. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. I can cherish this moment being able to talk with you on your podcast. Um, so yeah, to me, it's like really, really powerful to, keep death as a reminder. I actually have a tattoo on my chest that reminds me like you're going to die. Um, it just allows me to live life more fully. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's like the, it's the thing we all have in common. It's like, we all are going to die. And yeah. like you said, it is, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people to look at and like probably for everyone, it's uncomfortable to look at, but mm -hmm if you can become familiar with it, like you said, all of those like day-to-day -day worries just like go away. Mm -hmm. And even if you were to think, like I've heard this one, it's like think to a year ago today and like are any of the things you were worrying about, like do those matter anymore? <laughs> That's Probably a good point. Not. Yeah. So so many things, if you just zoom out, become nothing. You're like, oh, none of that really mattered. Right. And then it comes down to like, okay, if you didn't have any worries, you didn't have any fears, what would you do? Totally. And then you can, you're free. Mm -hmm. You get to act on those. Yeah. And I really love what you said about it's one thing that we all have in common. Um, Cause I think that helps to bring us together too. Like, you know, there's a lot of conflict in today's world right now with um, Israel, Ukraine, like, Lots of shit happening where people are just at each other's throats, whether it's politics as well. You know, people are very um, opinionated and feel that the other side is just like wrong. And um, there's a lot of hostility. And when I think about death as well as like something that we have in common, it's like, hey, like, why are we fighting so much? Like, we've got a limited time here. We're going to die. Like let's be together and like share more love and care for each other more. It's not worth fighting over. Like, you know, I need this land for oil or like whatever reasons are happening with war and politics. Um, 
like and then sure. like the fighting like the mm-hmm. fighting around the fighting which is like you said the whole political thing and like the oh this side is right or that that side is right those people as well it's like right we could all actually just not fight about that yeah totally and i think there are important issues that we still need to figure out and there can be like you know constructive conversations about those for sure but um yeah it's more like the hostility thing mm-hmm. i think could yeah be let go of a little bit what um so you've mentioned a few of them but what are you like your go-to day-to-day habits that either that you do day-to-day or that like oh when i did this that was amazing that just like increased your quality of life mm. yeah we had talked about um meditation already for a while i was doing cold approach daily um that got me in a really good headspace after a while even though it was really hard really hard um where you talked about that one too another one is cold exposure so um cold exposure is super awesome i think and uh do you have a cold plunge i do yeah so I actually just built one out. I converted a chest freezer into a cold plunge. Dude, I have one outside. Yeah. Oh, nice. But it's, I need to, I, I've been putting it off, like, maybe like three months ago. Uh-huh. It stopped working. Oh. Uh, um, where it, well, it, so it works, but I think some water got through because gotcha. it, like, shorts out the circuit every time. Oh. And so. That's a bummer. I'm going to empty it and probably, like, reseal it up and stuff. Yeah. I've just been putting that off. Gotcha. Okay, but so you have one. Yeah. Yeah. You do that um, every day or try to? Um, I don't necessarily plunge every day, but I will at least get like a little bit of cold in. Maybe it's just in a shower, mm-hmm. turning the shower cold. Um, so for any folks that don't have a cold plunge or are looking to get started, the shower is a really good place to start. Um, there's a lot of benefits to cold exposure. And there, I'm like, <laughs> how much detail doesn't make sense to get into right now um i mean psychologically you certainly feel a lot better after doing it it's really hard in a moment it can be very difficult um but i think it's similar to a lot of things that we've been talking about is it's really good mental practice are you able to just observe the sensation of being cold are you able to find grounding in that moment where your body is freaking out that's really good practice for real life And then there's also so many physical benefits as well. It's really good for your cardiovascular system. It's good for inflammation. It's good for your immune system. Um, I could go down a whole rabbit hole about that, but I don't want to take up too much time with all the science-y details. Yeah, it's definitely like a skill, though, I will say. Mm -hmm. Because like going to the um, Comfort Zone Fridays, Mm -hmm. um, when my, so I went one time after my cold punch had been out of service and so Mm -hmm. i hadn't been doing it for a few months and it was like way harder i noticed whereas Mm -hmm. before when i was cold plunging every day and then Mm -hmm. i would go to comfort zone like the cold punch like yes it's cold obviously and you still feel everything but like my impulse to get out was not as Mm. not as strong totally yeah so it's very interesting it's a skill yeah it's like other things in life it's a practice yeah Mm -hmm. and the more you do it the better you get at it yeah yeah okay so we have cold exposure meditation um did you name any others yet oh yeah so i used to do uh cold approach cold approach it's not so much these days um another one that i was doing for a while was uh, i know you had mentioned that you do this daily is wim hof breath work Mm -hmm. um so that is i would say in many ways similar to the things that we've discussed and that it's a good mental practice. Like sometimes just doing the breathing can be pretty uncomfortable. So are you able to find your way through that? And then the breath holds. Yeah, you can just find the deepest states of peace, relaxation, and being in those. Um, really great for relaxing just in terms of like stress relief or letting go of some of those trivial worries that we were talking about. And on a physical level, again, it's very, very good for you. Um, there's cardiovascular benefits. There's uh, immune system benefits. There's, yeah, all sorts of stuff that can be talked about at another point. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, any others? I'm, I've just recently tried to 
because I've I've kind of been in a divot in terms of like I went on a family vacation and then I was like that kind of was just like a clean slate and so mm-hmm. now I'm rebuilding. Um, and so I've been thinking about like what are the things that genuinely increase my quality of life that mm-hmm. I could do on a day to day. Gotcha. Um, I try to prioritize reading every mm-hmm. day. Um, ideally, I would read. I like to have extended periods, so I would read for like one hour just without any distractions. Um, I've mentioned this before, but walking my dog is yeah. one that's like a every time before I do it, it doesn't feel that important. And then mm-hmm. I do it and then I'm like, okay, that was, that was really helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else I have. Um, a big one, which is like, this sounds crazy but like cleaning my house spending like even five minutes cleaning either my room or the house in some way like just i don't know i i I really enjoy having just like a when i when my room is messy or my house is messy i feel like anxiety Uh it's like this feeling of like oh i should do that thing but i don't have time right now i should clean that like it's just reminders of things that i haven't done and so having like a habit of or a practice of just cleaning uh-huh taking care of my space that's another big one for me yeah and that doesn't sound crazy at all to me it sounds like a like an act of self-love to take yeah, care of yourself basically yeah is. yeah um yeah what's okay what does your uh dream life look like and what is missing from it today that's a great question um In some ways, even though I'm like depressed and burned out right now, I think I am living my dream life. Um, Yeah, like I had kind of left things behind to explore what I really wanted to explore. And I got to do that. So I'm, you know, very grateful for that experience. And to me a lot of what makes life incredibly good is not necessarily the circumstances that you're in but the way that you're looking at it and so being able to have gratitude for what you do have and accept things as they are um, I think is very powerful and for me in my depression like kind of accepting the fact that I've been depressed and that that's okay um has been like really helpful in quality of life there are still things that i like want to explore and do um so in the future i would love to be able to give more back in terms of these practices that i've explored and hopefully people don't go as hard (laughs) in them as i did um or maybe they do and that's a really good lesson for them that's kind of the way i see this as for Mm -hmm. myself too it's a really good lesson for me and It'll help me relate more to folks who have struggled with stuff like this too. Yeah, I'm. I'm um, sorry to cut you off. I'm yeah. curious how how you'll look back at this time, at this depression period. Yeah, have you um, thought about that? I have, and I'm ar- already kind of starting to look back on it a little bit because I'm starting to come out of it. I'm still in it, but I'm not like, you know, completely in the thick of it. Um, and one way that I've been relating with it and looking back on it is that. I think this is something that is really good for me. I think it's teaching me something very important about how to love myself and that there was a way in which I wasn't loving myself previously so that in the future I know, oh, like if something similar comes up, this big depression thing happened, I know more well how I can take care of myself. How can I do the more nourishing and loving thing for myself? So that's one way I'm looking at it. and. Another way that I'm looking at it is there are a lot of people who have gone through depression, who have experienced really difficult times. And for me to have also gone through a difficult time like this is going to help me be able to relate to them more. If a friend is going through a tough time, it may empower me to be more available for them, to better hold space for them. Um, I feel like I'll be more able to support someone who's going through a hard time. And so that feels really empowering as well. Um, not to say that, like, you know, if you hadn't experienced it, that you can't support someone. I think you definitely still can. 
Um, but having the shared experience, I think, will help with that. Right. Yeah. I think that's like, that's the way, you, the best way to connect with people is through some kind of shared experience. Totally. Whether it's actually the same thing or it's the same like emotion beneath it. That's, that's the way. Yeah. Like it might not be the literal same experience, but the same feelings might yeah. be there. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Peter yeah. Lynn, thanks for uh, coming on. Yeah. Um, thanks thank so you for much, your Will. openness. And yeah, I think people appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. All right. Bye, everybody.